1977, the worst winter in a century struck the United States. Arctic cold gripped the Midwest for weeks on end. Great blizzards paralyzed cities of the Northeast. One desperate night in Buffalo, eight people froze to death in marooned cars. Pat Bushnell was on the road that night. Traffic just absolutely stopped. I was afraid of being stuck in the car all night long with the uh, cold and the wind running out of gas. And then what? I think that if we had to go through a real bad winter, just like we just went through, I think we'd have to think about moving someplace else. Move where? The brutal Buffalo winter might become common all over the United States. Climate experts believe the next ice age is on its way. According to recent evidence, it could come sooner than anyone had expected. stations in the far north, temperatures have been dropping for 30 years. Sea coasts long free of summer ice are now blocked year round. According to some climatologists, within a lifetime, we might be living in the next ice age. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Of the nine planets in our solar system, only Earth has conditions favorable to human life. existence depends on a delicate balance of climate. Despite our modern technology, we are vulnerable to the winds of weather and environment. Blanketing large areas of the Earth's surface, great storms are among nature's most frightening events. Controllable tempests make us aware how fragile life on our planet really is. The comfortable cycle of spring sowing, summer growth, and fall harvest is, in terms of long history, abnormal. Only in the last 10,000 years has Earth enjoyed continuing warmth. Because of this, our population has exploded to 5 billion people. For most of the last million years, however, whole continents were buried by ice. As recently as 18,000 years ago, a mile-thick sheet stretched down from the Arctic Circle and covered what is now Seattle, Chicago, and Boston. New York Harbor was choked with ice flows. Winters were cold and snowy down to the Gulf of Mexico. All that remains of the great glaciers that once covered North America are the ice caps of the Canadian Arctic. If the ice spreads over the continent again, it is here on Baffin Island in northern Canada that the mysterious process will begin. We look to this lonely outpost for warnings of a new ice age. Straddling the Arctic Circle, Baffin Island is a harshly beautiful wilderness. It is larger than California, but not one tree grows on the entire island. The only vegetation is the stunted plant life of the tundra. Most of the inhabitants are Inuit Eskimos, whose ancestors migrated west from Greenland 
a thousand years ago. Today, the island is poised on the brink of ice age conditions, a critical signal post for changes in the Earth's climate. According to geologists, the last major ice age began on Baffin Island 115,000 years ago. Perpetual snow spread southward over the continents. The weight of many years of snow compressed into ice. The ice grew thicker until it covered Canada, the northern United States, and Europe to a depth of two miles. For 100,000 years, the ice remained over large areas of the continents. Then, it retreated to the Arctic, and for the last 10,000 years, we have flourished in a warm interglacial period. Our planet is crowded. What will we do when the fragile balance of climate shifts from today's abnormal warmth and the next ice age begins? One of the questions that I'm frequently asked is, when will this present warm interval end? And the best answer to that probably is that it has in fact already ended, and it ended 3,000 years ago right here on Baffin Island. Dr. Gifford Miller is a glaciologist from the University of Colorado. He's been studying the climate and glaciers of Baffin Island for the past six years. For the last 3,000 years, the summer temperatures have been getting colder and the amount of precipitation, and rainfall and snowfall has decreased so that the conditions have been drier and colder. And at the same time, uh, the glaciers have expanded and the most recent expansion, which occurred between 300 years ago and the turn of the present century, the glaciers attained their most extensive positions that they had during the last 8,000 years. The summer of 1972 was one of the uh, most severe summers on record and the ice never melted that summer. And when I returned to Broughton Island, one of the local settlements here, talking to the Inuit people, and they could only tell me that their fathers had told them of a time when the ice hadn't gone out. This once in a lifetime summer ice has surprised old time Arctic residents. Ernie Sieber is superintendent of Baffin Island National Park and has lived in the Arctic for over 20 years. We had, uh, in 1973, we had uh, ice all, uh, all over at the East Coast. Uh, the fjords, uh, some of the ice in the fjords uh, didn't even leave. And uh, almost every year since, uh, we had uh, ice uh, moving in and out of the fjords. Uh, so it looks like uh, the climate has changed. It looks like it, it turned colder. Since concern for our weather has increased, the park wardens now take daily records of temperatures, wind, and solar radiation. Weather data from stations all over the Arctic is collected and fed into central computers. Balloons are launched every day to monitor the winds and temperatures at high altitudes. The data shows that average temperatures in the Arctic have fallen dramatically over the last 30 years. In most locations, the drop has been about two degrees centigrade at that rate, the descent to ice age temperatures could take less than 200 years. It is not only the lonely Arctic that has cooled. The whole northern hemisphere is growing steadily colder. There is little doubt that someday the ice will return. At least eight times in the past million years, it has advanced and retreated with clockwork regularity. If we are unprepared for the next advance, the result could be hunger and death on a scale unprecedented in all of history. What scientists are telling us now is that the threat of an ice age is not as remote as they once thought. During the lifetime of our grandchildren, Arctic cold and perpetual snow could turn most of the inhabitable portions of our planet into a polar desert. In Greenland, the snows of centuries have piled up on the largest ice cap in the Northern Hemisphere. Scientists have recently discovered evidence of a climatic catastrophe. Drilling down over 1,400 meters, geologists have collected precious samples of ancient ice. 
Some of it fell as snow over 100,000 years ago. The ice is shipped south, where it is kept frozen at minus 35 degrees and carefully divided up for study. By separating out the two forms of oxygen in the ice, scientists have been able to chart the temperatures when it fell as snow. Near the bottom of the ice cap, they found traces of widespread freezing occurring with dramatic suddenness. Dr. Chester Langway is chairman of the geology department at the State University of New York, Buffalo. We have evidence from the ice core studies that approximately 89,000 years ago, the global climate changed from one of greater warmth than today into one of glacial severity. It is possible that a tremendous volcanic event occurred, shielding the sun, cooling the Earth's temperatures, and thereby providing the explanation of the advancing glaciers. The significance of this catastrophic event is that within a hundred year period of time, that the glaciers could have re-advanced over the surface of the Earth. It is possible that we may enter into such a cold climate almost instantaneously in the very near future. If the climate does suddenly cool, will we survive the change? Eighteen thousand years ago, Manhattan Island was buried under a mile of ice. Where the Hudson River flows today, there was a huge glacier. Pack ice filled the ocean off Long Island. We're only beginning to understand the cyclic history of the ice, but evidence is mounting that another ice age is due. The most persuasive data comes from beneath the sea. The research ship Vima sails the world's oceans, taking samples of sediments deposited long ago. A crew of scientists rig a long cylinder and drop it vertically to the ocean floor. The cylinder dredges up mud from the seabed in the form of long cores. The types of tiny fossils found at different levels in the core shows the sea temperatures of the past. Geologists have collected enough sea cores to form a detailed history of climate during the last million years. The cores are analyzed at the Lamont Doherty Geological Laboratory of Columbia University. Dr. James Hayes leads the research. The climatic record in these deep sea cores tells us that there have been eight ice ages in the last 700,000 years. It also tells us when they have occurred. This provides us with a test of various theories of the ice ages. We now have a theory that tells us that changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit act as a pacemaker for the ice age succession. Since this theory can precise, precisely predict when ice ages occurred in the past, which can be tested against these deep sea cores, it also can predict when ice ages will occur in the future. From this theory, we can say with confidence that we are currently heading toward another ice age. In the winter of 1976-77, one storm after another buried the Northeast under record amounts of snow. Months of brutal cold made much of the nation seem like the Arctic. Chicago, temperatures hovered at 19 degrees below zero. Dayton, 21 degrees below zero. Cincinnati, 25 degrees below zero. Of all the hard hit places, Buffalo, New York provides the best lesson. That unfortunate city had 44 consecutive days of snow. The first sudden blizzard paralyzed traffic. Thousands were forced to abandon their cars and seek refuge from the storm. Some who didn't were found frozen. 
as the storms continued the resources of government were strained snow plows had to be flown in by the air force even the national guard couldn't keep up with the unrelenting snow just how long can a modern city hold out when whole regions are cut off from food and fuel when the weather turns on us again how thin is the margin between life and death? When the snowfall finally stopped, downtown Buffalo lay quiet and deserted. Businesses remained closed for weeks. The airport was unusable. There was no way to reach or leave the city. The mail could not go through. Supplies of food and drugs ran perilously low. Ambulances could not reach the sick. For the old and infirm, it was a time of pain and misery. Suppliers of natural gas had to put emergency plans into effect, cutting off thousands of users. Electrical utilities ordered temporary blackouts. Fire engines froze in the sub-zero cold. In the suburbs, strong winds piled the snow in drifts as high as 30 feet. Many people had to enter their homes through second-story windows. No matter how much snow was cleared, fresh storms brought in more. Snowmobiles, the only viable form of transportation, were pressed into emergency service. Bushnell remembers how the Buffalo storm began. It was terrible. It was the worst winter that we have ever, ever had around here. When I left work, knowing it was bad, but still thinking I could get home, uh, gone maybe oh, three miles from work and realized that the roads were closed at that point, you couldn't walk. The wind coming right off the lake at that point, it's right in downtown Buffalo, was so brutal that you just couldn't walk. So I sat for a while, just sat and waited in the car, and finally, you know, realized that it was hopeless. The thought of freezing to death, that's kind of uh, frightening. My worst fear at that point was the children. I was worried sick about them. They were in the house alone. That was the biggest worry. To go through that every year just wouldn't be worth the fight. And it's a fight. It's a real fight. Half a million workers in the United States were laid off because of fuel shortages. Hundreds died of illness made worse by the cold. Had the storms continued much longer, millions would have been in jeopardy for lack of food and fuel. The experience of 1977 leads us to imagine the disaster the future might bring. In the descent to an ice age, one severe winter would follow another. Eventually, the snows of Buffalo would never melt. Increased demand for heating fuel would trigger an energy crisis beyond anything we can imagine. Winters in Dallas and Atlanta would grow cold and icy. Snows would blanket Southern California and Northern Florida. The people of Mississippi and Alabama would have to contend with old-fashioned New England winters. Icy winds would sweep the Kansas wheat fields. Colorado's summer grazing lands would resemble the Arctic tundra. In California, glaciers would advance from the Sierra Nevada toward the fertile San Joaquin Valley food production would plummet. Prices would soar out of sight. Every winter, the line of year-round snow would move further and further south. If the catastrophic event of 89,000 years ago repeats itself, the ice could return within a single lifetime. If an ice age is coming, what can we do to stop it? Nuclear energy might be used to loosen polar ice caps. Sea ice could be melted by covering it with black soot to increase the absorption of sunlight. 
Dr. Steven Schneider is a climatologist from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Can we do these things? Yes. But will they make things better? I'm not sure. We can't predict with any certainty what's happening to our own climatic future. How can we come along and intervene then in that ignorance? You could melt the ice caps. What would that do to the coastal cities? The cure could be worse than the disease. Would that be better or worse than the risk of an ice age? If the polar ice melted completely, sea level would rise 180 feet. New Orleans, San Francisco, and New York would be submerged. Clearly, one of the future's great problems will be to survive the next ice age. Earth, water, air, and ice comprise a delicate system in which everything is connected to everything else. It's the interaction between people and climate that worry me the most because with everyone jammed in in countries, locked in in national boundaries, a change in climate means a redistribution of where the rain is, where the growing seasons are. My worst fear is that the climate could induce a change in some country that would be devastating to their local survivability, and that would lead them to desperate acts that could drag everybody else down. In the past, weather disasters have fostered a spirit of mutual concern. When drastic changes in our climate occur, hopefully the same acts of courage and cooperation will prevail. <laughs>